In the last video, we got ourselves a very high level overview of what an elf executable file was. And in this video, we're going to do what any logical person would do next. And that would be to hack the Pentagon. I was obviously kidding back there, but we will be hacking some simple binaries today and hopefully you will learn something new. Before we jump into offending some binaries, we will first have a look at Linux file permissions. As you might already know, every Linux file has a set of permissions and we can find them when we run the command ls-l. We can see the permissions associated with the file listed as the first column. We can also see that there's this RWX, which means the owner can have, you know, read and write and also executable permissions. And the format follows the same for a group and also others. Let's do the same for passwd file. We run ls-l and the directory where the passwd executable exists. And we see RWS as the permissions. So what is this S in the permissions? The S is something called as a set UID bit. If this bit is enabled on a binary executable, then we can execute this binary with permissions of a different user. Normally, when you execute a binary file, it becomes a process. And this process is bound by some permissions. These permissions are usually set by the kernel to the same permissions as the user who executed this file. That means if Kanye executes the file, then the process can do whatever the user Kanye can do. But with set UID bit turned on, the file can be executed effectively as another user. So for example, if the user Kanye executes this passwd file, then it basically runs as Kanye, but with effective permissions of root meaning that the executable can do almost anything the root can do. This makes sense because the passwd executable is used to update the password of a user. And these passwords are stored in slash etsy slash shadow file. And this file is owned by root. But we can still write to this file because of the set UID a bit turned on. So we'll start by looking at a binary that uses a dangerous function in an unsafe manner. There are a bunch of functions in almost every general programming language out there that can make the binary vulnerable just because it's used in an insecure way or for an incorrect purpose. For example, the use of system function in C or C++. The system function executes any command that you give to it when you hear that, obviously your security cells in your brain should be like beep, 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 warning, threat detect, DEFCON 1, blah, blah, blah. But just imagine what could go wrong if a user supplied input lands inside this function. That's right, it's worse than an asteroid hit. Anyways, let's go ahead and try some challenges with increasing difficulty levels. All right, level one. Let's take a look at the code. It seems that the user input is coming from the arguments and it goes directly into the execvp function. If we do a quick man on this function, which is basically the manual, we can see that it simply executes a file. Like if I send the word or string ls as input, it will execute this command for me because ls is a binary file that's located in bin ls, I believe. And this is true for most other commands. But the point is, it executes your code. It's one of those dangerous functions. All right, now let's go ahead and compile the code ourselves and test it locally by manually enabling the set UID bit as root. Uh, this process is same for the rest of the levels as well. But we're not going to be covering it every single time. This is the only time that we're going to do it. All right, let's go ahead and solve this challenge. Uh, the goal of the challenge is we as the pwn user uh, have to read the flag file that's only readable by root. The solution is pretty straightforward since the user's input coming as an argument lands directly inside this execvp function, uh, we should be able to get root privileges. 
let's go ahead and try it with an ID command. As you can see, there's this UID field, which means the effective user ID is set to zero, which is that of the root. And now it's just a matter of reading the file using the cat command. And there you go, we have the flag. Let's go ahead and take a look at this next level. The binary doesn't have a set UID bit, but it receives the input over the network. Assume that this binary is running on like a server, uh, which also has the flag in it. All we have to do is somehow read the flag by interacting with this binary remotely over the network. So now let's go ahead and look at the code. As you can see, there's a bunch of stuff happening, but basically the program takes no more than three characters as input and creates a new string. Then this new string is passed to the system function which executes uh, the string. So our input does land in one of these dangerous system functions, but we have some other problems. Problem one, we're not the entire string. We're just a small part of the whole string. Apparently there are some ZSH things going on over there. And problem two would be that it's very short. It's like only three characters long. So how do we read a file with commands that are only three characters long? We'll see. Let's think about the problem one. So it's doing some ZSH stuff, specifically doing the ZSH dash C. Not sure what this is, but let's go ahead and check out the manual for more information. So when we do man ZSH and scroll down a little bit and you're gonna see the dash C. It apparently takes the first argument and executes it as a command. So basically this will execute our command in the ZSH shell and not in the default SH shell. When this code gets executed, it starts a shell at bin SH. Then it executes this piece of code, which again executes another shell, which is the ZSH shell. In the end, our three character long command will run inside a ZSH shell that is running inside a normal shell. Like I said, the challenge is running on a server and we need to connect to it to be able to talk to it. And we do that using the netcat program. So we do netcat space the IP and then the port and this will go ahead and connect to the actual machine. Let's go ahead and mess with this first. Let's uh, try a bunch of I's. You can use any characters you want, but you know, true elite hackers only use the letter I's. You'll know why in the future, but for now, just type anything you want. Hit enter and see what comes out. And we can see that the command was invalid, obviously, but we also see that there's only the three characters, uh, the first three characters of our entire input is only accepted, which is expected. But now let's go ahead and try something like a very small command like id, which only seems to take two characters. And it works, right? Great. Now let's deal with the problem two, which was that we only have three characters to mess around with. Our goal is to read the flag file that's also on the server. So how do we usually read the file? Um, well, there are a bunch of commands to do the exact same thing, but oftentimes we rely on a program called cat. So we do cat and then the file name and it would read the file for us. But also you could do something like cat and then a redirection and then the file name. And this will also read the file. Interestingly, ZSH has a neat set of shorthand features, something like uh, if I wanted to change my directory to Etsy, I don't have to type CD space Etsy. Instead, I could just type Etsy and I'm already in that folder. Similarly, we also have a shorthand to read a file, which is just the redirection character. So if I do just the redirection and flag.txt, it would just read it for me. But still, it's pretty long. It's not three characters long, yeah? We can fix that with the wildcard, which is the symbol asterisk. So wildcard matches all the folders or actually all the files in the current directory. So when you do a redirection and an asterisk, 
which is the wildcard. It will read all the files in the current directory and boom, we did that in two characters, but not so fast, right? <laughs> we still have to escape the redirection character or else it will be interpreted and executed by the normal shell instead of the ZSH shell. So for that, we need three characters. But in the end, if we give it a shot, it works like a charm. All you have to do is just scroll down a little bit. There you go. All right, we're at the final level now. And this time it's gonna be again, a privilege escalation to root. And then we read the flag file just like we did the first challenge. All right, so let's take a look at the code now. It's only one line, great. So it simply executes the date command and that's it. Now the question is, is it exploitable? And where does one even start? Well, a good place to start would be to reevaluate our presumed assumptions. One such assumption is that the execvp function executes a given command. But let's go through the process of actually executing the command, shall we? When the function is called, it will go ahead and execute. But before that, it needs to find where the date file is, right? So how do we find a date? Well, simple, we just go out, make some friends, hit on the one you like, but dropping an exploit such as getting a root shell on the first try would be, uh, yeah, probably impossible, but good luck. Anyways, getting back to hacking, almost all the commands you type in your terminal are just other programs that are stored somewhere else on the same computer. When you run the command, the shell goes ahead and finds the executable that you want to run and then runs it for you. But the question is, how does it know where to find the file or where does it exist? Short answer, the environment variables. Almost every process has some environment variables in them. And these variables can be set for the process by itself or at the time of execution, it can inherit these environment variables from the parent process. For example, if we have some environment variables set on the bash shell process, and then we try to run another process like ls inside the bash shell, then the ls command will inherit almost all the environment variables from the bash shell process. You might already see where this is going. Among the process environment variables, one of them is path. This variable holds all the paths to the directories that the shell has to look through when it wants to find the executable. So the attack idea is, first of all, we try to set the path variable on our shell such that while executing the process, it will look for our malicious current directory instead of slash user or slash bin. Secondly, we go ahead and create another executable with the same name as date so that our file will be executed instead of the original one. All right, so let's go ahead and try to write a malicious date executable. We will try to get a root shell using the execvp function. And we will also specify the dash p option on the bash shell so that it does not drop the effective permissions that we get along the way. We compile this file and now we have our very own fake date executable. Now let's go ahead and execute the vulnerable application normally for the first time. And we see the date printed out just as expected. Now let's go ahead and do the same thing, but with our path set to our current directory so that it will find our fake date application first instead of the original slash user slash bin date file. So yeah, let's go ahead and execute this and All right, if you want to try this out yourself, head over to hackercamp.co all the code that was showcased in this video will be available with setup and build instructions on there. So for now, you just have to download the code and build it yourselves. Hopefully not for long. I'm still working on hosting these challenges myself. And if you guys have any questions, head over to my Discord. Uh, again, links are in the description. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you guys in the next one.
Peace.